This video will go over some of the concepts that we discussed earlier in the year regarding nutrition. There will be questions on the CNA exam about nutri nutrition, which is why we want to review it. So this is just a basic overview of nutrition. So nutrition is the process of ingestion, digestion, absorption, and use of food and fluids by the body. A nutrient is a substance that is ingested, digested, absorbed, and used by the body. Nutrients are grouped into fats, proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, and water. One gram of fat is equal to nine calories. One gram of protein is equal to four calories and one gram of carbohydrate is equal to four calories. And a calorie is just the fuel or energy value of food. A well-balanced diet and correct calorie intake are needed for growth, healing, and body function. So these are the different types of nutrients. So water is the most important nutrient and is needed for life functions. It can be ingested as a liquid but it is also part of foods. It is 50 to 60% of an individual's body weight. Water transports waste products out of the body. It helps people cool via perspiration or sweating. It keeps mucous membranes moist and it helps joints move smoothly. Next, we have protein and protein is needed for tissue growth and repair. Next is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates provide energy and fiber for bowel elimination. Sources of carbohydrates include fruit, vegetables, breads, cereals, and sugar. Dietary fiber is found in plant foods. Fiber is not digested. It provides the bulky part of chyme for elimination. Sugars are broken down by the body into glucose. The glucose is then used for energy. If carbohydrates are not used, they turn to fat. So fats, they produce energy. They add flavor and help the body use certain vitamins. So vitamins A, D, E, and K are the fat soluble vitamins, meaning they're only dissolved in fats. Unneeded dietary fat is stored in the body as adipose tissue. Some fats are healthy. Healthy fats include salmon, avocados, and olive oil. Unhealthy fats usually come from animal sources or are processed foods made from vegetable oils. Solid fats are solid at room temperature, so butter, margarine, or shortening. Oils are liquid fats. Oils can come from plants and fish. Oils are not a food group. Adult women are allowed five to six teaspoons of oil daily. Adult men are allowed to have six to seven teaspoons daily. Next, we have vitamins and they're needed for certain body functions. As I previously said, the body stores vitamins A, D, E, and K as fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin C and B complex vitamins are not stored. They must be ingested daily. So vitamin C and the B-complex vitamins are dissolved in water. Finally, minerals are needed for bone and tooth formation, nerve and muscle function, and fluid balance. Calcium is needed for bones and teeth. Iron is needed to transport oxygen throughout the body. These are the food groups. So grains are food made of wheat, rice, oats, cornmeal, barley, or other cereal grains. Bread, pasta, oatmeal, breakfast cereals, tortillas, and grits are examples. Whole grains have the entire grain kernel. Refined grains are processed to remove the grain kernel. So for instance, white flour, white bread, white rice. Refined grains have less dietary fiber than whole grains. Next are vegetables. They can be raw, cooked, fresh, frozen, canned, dried, or juiced. Some examples are broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, spinach. Next are fruits. So any fruit or 100% fruit juice counts as part of the fruit group. Individuals should avoid fruits that are canned in syrup because the syrup adds sugar. 
Instead, they should choose fruits that are canned in 100% fruit juice or water. Examples of fruits are apples, strawberries, cantaloupe, watermelon. Next, we have dairy, and that includes all fluid milk products, yogurt, and cheese. And then last, we have protein. So protein foods are made from meat, poultry, seafood, eggs, processed soy products, nuts, and seeds. Beans and peas are also in this group, and they're also in the vegetable group, so they're in both. So the dietary guidelines are issued for Americans every five years by the government. The my plate symbol, which is the picture on the right side of the slide, encourages healthy eating from all five food groups. So we have fruits, grains, protein, vegetables, and dairy. The USDA also provides physical activity recommendations for Americans. In the hospital or the facility, you may see patients who are ordered uh, different special types of diets. They are ordered to address nutritional deficiencies, disease, weight gain or loss, and or to remove certain substances from the diet. So the first type is a regular or general diet. It's also called a house diet, and it just means that there are no dietary limits or restrictions. If a patient is on a clear liquid diet, they can have foods that are liquid at room temperature and clear enough to see through. So for instance, jello, apple juice, water, coffee or tea without cream. A clear liquid diet doesn't provide enough nutrients to maintain health for a long period of time. Next, we have a full liquid diet, and that's foods and liquids that can be poured at room temperature. So this includes all the foods that are on the clear liquid diet, but it also includes strained soups, milk, milkshakes, plain ice cream, plain pudding, and yogurt. The fluid restricted diet is ordered for residents with heart or kidney disease. It identifies a specific amount of, of fluids a person can have in a 24 hour period. A soft diet restricts foods that are hard to chew or swallow. It restricts raw fruits and vegetables and high fiber and spicy foods. A mechanical soft diet is semi-solid foods. So the foods are chopped or blended to make them easier to chew. However, in comparison to a soft diet, the mechanical soft diet does not restrict high fiber or spicy foods. Next, we have pureed. So those are foods that have a smooth, uniform texture and hold their shape on a spoon. So they're pudding-like. High protein diets are ordered when an individual has wounds that need to be healed or pressure injuries that need to be healed. And then finally, a sodium controlled diet um, is ordered for patients who have cardiac disease. So with too much sodium, the body retains water and tissue swell. There's extra fluid in the blood vessels, which makes the heart work harder. So sodium controlled diet lowers the amount of sodium in the body, which prevents the body from retaining as much water. Um, if you are on a diabetic meal plan, um, you have healthy foods from each food group, um, but carbohydrate counting is used, which is where the person keeps track of the amount of carbohydrates eaten each day. It's important that people on a diabetic meal plan have meals and snacks at the same time each day to help maintain their blood glucose level. So if you recall, diabetes is a chronic illness where the body cannot produce or use insulin properly. Insulin is what lets the body use sugar. So without that insulin, the sugar builds up in the bloodstream, which is why individuals need to monitor their carbohydrates and eat healthy foods. And then last but not least, we have a gluten-free diet. So gluten is a protein found in wheat products. Residents with celiac disease cannot tolerate gluten. Okay, so measuring food take. So these questions are always on the CNA exam. Um, so to measure food intake, you compare the food left to what is served. To estimate, you record the approximate amount of food eaten. To calculate, you subtract the amount left from the amount served and then divide the amount by the amount served. So the number of pieces making up a whole and then you multiply by 100. Um, in the facilities, you'll oftentimes just estimate how much a patient ate. And as the CNA, you would be responsible for reporting that to the nurse. So if they ate 25% of their meal, 50%, and so on. So this chart just kind of goes over the percentages. So on the prior slide, 
it was the pictures so you could visualize like what their plate might look like and then this is just what it means in words so if patient refused their meal they didn't eat any zero percent they refused it completely if they ate poorly they ate about 25 percent of the tray is consumed or they ate 50 percent of just one item fair means that approximately one half of the food on the tray was consumed Good or 75% means that the majority of the meal is consumed, but a significant amount of one or more items is left. And then 100% just means that the entire meal was consumed or eaten. So if you look at this picture, on the left is the tray like when it came out, and then on the right is when the patient is finished. So 50% of that food was consumed. And if we look back, 50% means approximately one half of the food is consumed. So they, you know, drank some of their drink, they ate a portion of their sandwich and all of their pudding. For this one, if we look on the left, it's the tray like before the patient eats it. And then on the right is what the patient has eating, eaten. And we could say that about, you know, 50 to 75% of the food was consumed there. So they didn't really touch that yellow pudding or, or yogurt, whatever that is. They ate a good portion of their soup and they drank all of their blue drink. So there are some fluid orders you may see in the hospital or facility. So first we have encourage fluid. And what that means is that the person needs to drink an increased amount of fluids. It's used to treat or manage dehydration, treat UTIs and kidney stones. Restrict fluid means that fluids are limited to a certain amount. They're used, that order is used to manage edema, kidney failure, and heart failure. NPO, or nothing by mouth, means the person cannot eat or drink anything, and it's used before surgery and before some diagnostic tests. And then thicken liquids means that water and fluids are thickened by the dietary department, and it's used for patients who have difficulty swallowing. Intake and output is also something you might see on the CNA exam. So with intake, all oral fluids are measured and recorded, including foods that melt at room temperature. Output includes urine, vomit, diarrhea, and wound drainage. And those amounts are measured and then recorded or the information is given to the nurse for recording. Next, we're gonna discuss fluid balance. So water is needed to live Death can result from too much or too little water. Water is ingested through fluids and foods. Water is lost through urine, feces, and vomit. It's also lost through the skin, perspiration, and the lungs, expiration. An adult needs about 1,500 milliliters of water daily just to live. And then about 2,000 to 250 milliliters of water or fluid are needed for normal fluid balance. To stay hydrated, which means having adequate amounts of water in the body tissues, fluid intake must roughly equal output. So edema is the swelling of body tissues with water, and that occurs when fluid intake exceeds fluid output. It's common with people with heart or kidney disease, and you can see edema in the legs, ankles, and feet. Liver disorders can cause swelling in the abdomen or ascites. Pulmonary edema is a severe form of edema that affects the lungs. Edema is a sign of fluid overload, which means the patient has too much fluids. Other signs are weight gain, a moist cough, shortness of breath on exertion, and the skin and legs becoming shiny. Next, we have dehydration, which is a decrease in the amount of water and body tissues. Some common causes of dehydration are bleeding, dementia because patients forget or refuse to drink, diarrhea, fever, poor intake, diaphoresis or excessive like sweating, and vomiting. Signs and symptoms of dehydration are hypotension or low blood pressure, confusion, dark urine, dizziness, fatigue, headache, muscle cramps, low urine output, tachycardia, fast heart rate, tachypnea, fast breathing rate, or salivating. Dehydration can cause constipation, it can lead to UTIs, or it can cause changes in level of consciousness. These are just some important 
conversions to remember. So one cc is the same thing as one milliliter. One ounce is equal to 30 milliliters. One teaspoon is equal to five milliliters. And one tablespoon is equal to 15 milliliters. So let's practice. A coffee cup holds eight ounces. The CNA measures 90 milliliters left in the cup following breakfast. How much did the patient drink at breakfast? So the first thing you need to do is convert the cup, the eight ounces, into milliliters. So we know that there are 30 milliliters in each ounce. Eight, the amount that the coffee cup was, times 30 gives us 240 milliliters. So to start, the patient had 240 milliliters in the cup. That's the full serving of coffee. Then you subtract the 90 milliliters, which was left in the cup following breakfast, and you get 150 milliliters. So the patient drank 150 milliliters of coffee at breakfast.